The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. That is uh, such a cool trailer. <laughs> um, well, everyone, welcome to the STOA. This is our first symposium on uh, the meta crisis and existential risk. And our third discussion of the day, we have the pleasure of speaking with Thomas Moynihan about the sort of history of existential risk. He's going to give us a really nice backdrop that comes out of his new book, as we just saw with the trailer, X Risk. If you guys haven't picked this book up yet, obviously, I highly recommend. But uh, Obviously, Thomas will, will do that convincing himself throughout the next uh, hour. So before we get started, I just ask that everyone puts their questions in the chat. And then when we're done our intro, um, Thomas and I will uh, start tagging you guys in for some questions. So um, populate the chat as you guys see fit. Um, Thomas, I suppose I'll give you a quick intro before handing it off to you. Um, Thomas is a researcher from the UK, having completed his PhD on the history of human extinction at the University of Oxford. He's now working at the Future of Humanity Institute alongside the likes of Nick Bostrom, Toby Ord, Anders Sandberg, and many more. He's recently released this book, X Risk, How Humanity Discovered Its Own Extinction, which provides a history of our understanding or lack thereof of the potential for our own extinction. So Thomas, I think I'll hand it off to you now, and maybe if you can just expand upon the backdrop of this book and your own story, you know, how you actually came to study X risk as a subject of history. Yeah, um, first off, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I've been really looking forward to this. Um, so yeah, how did I come to this? Um, uh, well, I guess, so I've been working on the topic um, for a while now, probably um, something around seven, eight, maybe nine years. Um, and originally, so I, I uh, did English at undergraduate. Um, and uh, but, but through that became interested in uh, the history of ideas. So uh, this might strike people as somewhat of a strange thing to be doing, because some people that I speak to, they don't, uh, they're, they're surprised when they hear that this is a thing that people even do. Um, but yeah, the way that I always like to uh, try and explain it is that uh, in the same way that, um, uh, you know, technologies need to be invented, um, you know, the steam engine, uh, the plow, all of those things, in the same way that they need to be invented, so too do ideas. And it's really important because uh, the way we interact with the world, um, the way we decide what's best to do in the world, and the way we decide how to best fit that idea of what's best to do in the world into the world as it is, uh, all of that relies on the ways we think. Um, and the ways people think have changed a lot uh, and I think have become a lot more complicated. Um, and so one of the major things that really interests me and always has done um, uh, is, you know, as soon as I could think coherent thoughts uh, was how uh, massive uh, kind of, um, you know, worldview level shifts happen. Um, so, you know, the ones that we all kind of know, the famous ones, I guess, the big ones, uh, the Copernican revolution, you know, the shift in thinking um, that the sun goes around the earth to vice versa. 
Um, the other one is, uh, you know, um, Darwin and the way that he changed our view of ourselves within the world, how everything hangs together. Um, but also other ones like, uh, you know, the shift from thinking that um, slavery is part of the natural order to realizing that it's atrocious. The same with uh, equal rights for, for all people. These are all huge shifts in worldview. Um, so they've always interested me and I've always been um, curious as to the dynamics of it. Um, and uh, yeah, early on, um, you know, uh, I, I, I've always been interested in kind of, um, you know, the, these end of the world scenarios. Uh, and I noticed that, um, you know, there are tons of books out there that you can find on, um, you know, the end of the world, the history of the end of the world, how pe different people have thought about it uh, at different places and different times. Um, you know, the history of apocalypse, the history of a millennium, there are plenty of uh, accounts of that out there. Uh, and they often would kind of just have, you know, continue it straight up to the present day and kind of uh, often talk about, say, Cold War fears uh, of worst case outcomes from thermonuclear disaster as kind of uh, the most, the newest form of apocalypticism. Uh, this was the the main way, obviously there are exceptions, but this was the main way in which historians um, and people working within kind of uh, literary cultural studies uh, were talking about these things. And I felt that, and this was mainly through reading the work of Nick Bostrom. Um, uh, so he, you know, from the two, from around 2000 onward has been kind of, you know, uh, really thinking through this concept of existential risk, um, which is, you know, a scenario that stops humanity from fulfilling its potential. So that includes extinction, but it isn't exclusively extinction. Um, you know, it was through reading that and it took, a, it took years for it all to click together. Um, I've kind of passed through lots of different worldviews and lots of different opinions on how all these things uh, fit together myself. So, you know, I've, uh, but it's, it's kind of all clicked together. And I realized that, um, yeah, existential risk was a really important idea, but also a really new one. Um, and human extinction itself, also uh, a new idea, slightly older than existential risk, I think, but also very new. So I just wanted to uh, kind of answer that question for myself is, um, you know, considering, uh, well, accepting the point that I felt very strongly, that there was something new in this type of thinking, accepting that point, and presumably we can talk about that in a bit, maybe, uh, accepting that point, why? Why is it new? Why could people not think it before? Why not earlier? Why were there not people in, you know, ancient Greece or ancient Sumeria who are, uh, you know, thinking about the end in the, the end of human, uh, the human project in the way that we now do? Uh, why now? Why not earlier? So that, yeah, that was the question that I, uh, I guess I've been, um, yeah, playing around with for, for, for years now. That's great. Well, maybe we can riff off of sort of why new, why now a little bit. Um, you know, in your first chapter, you mentioned um, something along the lines of the principle of, of plenitude as sort of being sort of fundamental to the shift from where we were a few hundred years ago to our um, sort of recognition that extinction could be something in our future that exists outside of the way in which we're used to sort of conceptualize something like, uh, you know, the apocalypse, for instance. So I'm wondering, could you just dive into that a little bit and uh, maybe articulate why couldn't we think about these things a few hundred years ago? Why is this such a new topic that has come into a sort of the realm of philosophy and science? Mm, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I should mention, I noticed Phil Tors is in, in the chat here, and uh, he's also working, he's written a book also on this topic. So I'm sure when he's presenting afterwards, you know, he can, uh, you know, talk through his version of these events. So I should say that, that you know, I'm not the only one that's ever asked these questions. Um, but uh, so to, yeah, to take up your question on um, the principle of plenitude in particular. Um, so the principle of plenitude is a um, subtle assumption that uh, I would say um, more or less uh, universally was accepted till some point in the late uh, Middle Ages. And it's the idea that all possibilities are eventually realized. Uh, to keep this simple, um, this actually precludes thinking about species extinctions, because uh, if it was possible for species to be extinct, then that would have already happened 
Uh, therefore, we would live in a world where we wouldn't see any species. Um, Aristotle, actually, for example, quite explicitly says things along these points. He says, if something has been known to have always existed, we know that it necessarily exists and therefore does omnitemporally and also forever. Um, so there are these assumptions about possibility uh, that are kind of, I think, um, baked into the way that uh, humans quite generally think about the world. So um, in the philosophy of science, there's this idea of uh, uh, folk psychology or the manifest image, which is kind of just how we all kind of interact with the world pre-theoretically before some scientist comes along and goes, no, that table's not actually made out of, you know, wood in the sense you think. It's made out of, you know, lots of tight, very tiny things uh, that you can't see or touch or scent. Um, so I think it's part of this folk psychological worldview to think that uh, basically all possibilities are eventually realized which also means that you think that nature is basically always as full of things as it can be. Uh, which is to say in a different, uh, from the other direction is to say that there are no uh, gaps within nature where something could be, but just simply never is. So there's no kind of uh, vacua. There's no places where a good thing or just anything really um, could be, but just never is for no justified reason. Um, so the principle of plenitude is similar to another philosophical idea, the principle of sufficient reason, which means that there must be a kind of justifiable, rational reason for the way everything is. Uh, principle of plenitude means that there can't be any unjustifiable or irrational absences. And of course, there's something very irrational or unjust, unjust about extinction. Uh, it's a massive wasted opportunity. So basically, you know, to get away from the thorny, very philosophical um, kind of aspects of this principle, uh, and it can get quite thorny quite quickly, it's basically just this idea that there are no wasted opportunities within existence uh, for things to exist. Um, so how does this actually kind of play out in worldviews? Uh, so for the pagan pre-Christian mindset in ancient Greece, um, uh, you know, as I've kind of hinted at with talking about Aristotle, there was often a sense of eternal return or a very cyclical sense of history. Um, so Aristotle himself, uh, I found him the other day saying that we cannot actually say that we live after Troy. Uh, because history is so cyclical that Troy will happen again at some point. So in a sense, we also live before Troy. And he also says it might be more accurate to say that we live before Troy because we might be closer to the end of the cycle. Um, so within this kind of history, uh, this very cyclical sense, uh, there's no irreversibility. There's no kind of uh, loss of potential. There's no uh, loss of uh, the potential of something to be permanently. Things can disappear but it's always um, kind of spatio-temporally local. So it's always temporary. Or say if something disappears here, we can be confident that somewhere else in the cosmos or on the planet, it will continue to exist. Um, so ancient thinkers were often quite explicit about this. Uh, Plato, for example, speaks about humanity disappearing from the earth, but then also qualifies that uh, basically on the same page by saying, um, you know, humanity will return. Um, the Christian worldview, obviously, it becomes more complicated because they have a very linear sense of history. Uh, but often, um, due to their faith in a uh, divine agent who makes sure that we live in the best of all possible worlds, they are also quite explicit. The kind of great Augustine Aquinas, uh, they're kind of gr uh, explicit about the fact that uh, no matter what humans do, kind of the amount of good things in the cosmos always remains constant. Um, you know, we might have slipped up by eating the apple and kind of screwed things up a little bit, uh, but everything is good because, you know, God created the world. Uh, so we can't lose potential to do, do good things that will remain regardless of our kind of imperfections and sinning. Um, and you'd think maybe with the Copernican revolution that I mentioned earlier, this kind of birth of the scientific modern worldview, um, you know, suddenly we th think that we live in a vaster cosmos, uh, kind of, you know, the, what historians refer to as the disenchantment of uh, the universe. We might think that suddenly this kind of comfort, this very secure worldview dissipates and starts to disintegrate. It didn't happen so fast. Uh, so we're talking kind of from 1500 onwards uh, for another couple of uh, hundred years, there remained a very strong uh, confidence 
again emerging from the principle of plenitude that um, you see all these other planets out there, uh, all these other stars, they're presumably suns with planets going around them, just like our own solar system. Uh, but if they weren't all occupied with valuable things, and that would be a massive waste of space, that would be a massive waste of opportunity. So plenitude kicks in again, and it kind of made people just kind of presume ahead of evidence that uh, the planets were all populated with valuable things. And even further, a lot of people were quite confident that they also looked and basically functionally were the same as us. Uh, you know, you find some people saying that they enjoy music, geometry, maths, philosophy, they enjoy all the things we enjoy. Um, and even more shockingly, perhaps to our kind of modern sensibilities, more modern sensibilities, I should say, um, you find people actually explicitly saying uh, that the destruction of planet Earth basically wouldn't matter. It would be a triviality um, in the wider scheme of things, not because of, you know, the fact that the universe is nihilistic and awful, uh, which you might find kind of people like Nietzsche later on saying, uh, but specifically because the universe we live in is obviously so full of value. There are humans everywhere. So if Earth gets destroyed in some astrophysical disaster, Eh, so be it, it's a drop in the ocean. Um, and so, yeah, the story that I try to tell in the book is how that kind of worldview of plenitude, uh, that general attitude, that kind of uh, relationship to the universe, how that fell apart. And we began to realize, you know, through empirical discoveries, but also very general uh, theoretical shifts in the way that we, you know, the confidence that we hold in certain things, you know, realizing that perhaps ahead of evidence, we shouldn't presume that the universe is maximally populous, how all that fell apart. And that was basically these conditions required uh, to think about human extinction and think about, moreover, the fact that it really matters, which is the idea of existential risk. Oh, Evan, I, I can't hear you. I'm not sure if that's just on my end. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, that, that was on my end. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, riffing off what you said in terms of the idea of existential risk really mattering, there was a great quote in your book um, in the beginning that you said, you know, apocalypse secures the sense of ending, whereas extinction anticipates the ending of sense. And I thought that was just a really, really nice way to catch essentially what you, what you just said in terms of there being a fundamental shift between the idea of sort of apocalyptic scenarios, for instance, versus um, the idea of um, an ending to humanity, the ending of sense, the ending of meaning. I'm wondering if you could um, just sort of tease those apart a little more. Mm, yeah, so my sense is, and, and, and here we have to talk about, you know, kind of, uh, I guess, you know, transcultural, um, you know, uh, look across all cultures and all their senses of apocalypse or doomsday um make vast generalizations but you know despite that in making those generalizations um and there are interesting exceptions here and there um but none that have all of the ingredients that make extinction in the modern sense um so uh, often basically apocalypse the idea of apocalypse and i, I always say this is it's, it's baked into the word itself because you know as i'm sure some of you are aware it means revelation so something is being revealed in apocalypse um so think of the Christian judgment day. It's in its judgment. It's the tribunal of all, of all things, you know, uh, things have, will in that final moment uh, be sorted. All the good and the bad will be sorted. Or if you believe in universal salvation, everything becomes good and everything shakes out great in the end. Um, so that's conciliatory. Uh, it's uh, history is tending towards this massive reconciliation independently of what we do as individuals. And also as you know wider aggregates uh it's all going to be okay of course as i said you can find exceptions to that you can find you know uh, quite seemingly nihilistic um uh, you know apocalypses and doomsdays uh so i think like the mayan some of their their kind of uh, doomsdays was you know the world would just end if humans stopped sacrificing for the sun gods now you know that's a quite troubling and disturbing and in it, very interesting but it's also you know the whole fate of the universe has collapsed into human action here and now uh, it'll end if we stop doing the right thing so that's another thing is often uh, apocalypses doomsdays uh, mythological ends of the world uh, everything ends without humanity 
um, the it's often it's quite a modern idea to think of you know the the whole universe and its kind of vastness and its independence and its basically unresponsivity to everything that we morally desire and wish for continuing without us um you know also just the biosphere just you know the rest of life on the planet potentially continuing without us that's a very modern idea as well um so you know also another point i should make is a lot of these are very cyclical so that end of the world and you find this in like the buddhist uh kind of eschatology it's always nested in it within these cycles so the world burns and then returns um so yeah within the modern idea of extinction um as opposed to that sense of comfort where um you know things are going to work out fate might be inscrutable to us but we know it's in good hands the best hands god's hands right uh instead of that um everything that we care about and that we might recognize as valuable uh is potentially at stake um you know uh if we manage to wreck the biosphere then that's it for not just human life but all life uh on you know earth emerging life uh and the universe continues and doesn't care um and it requires that recognition even though it's quite alienating and disturbing it requires that recognition to realize that something's really at stake in this. And if our actions can influence uh, avoiding that outcome, then that's one of the most important things that we can um, think and do. Um, so I hope, yeah, I hope that kind of fleshes out the sense of ending, ending of sense a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, totally. That was great. Um, I'm thinking maybe we'll pull it forwards a little bit now to almost modernity, where uh, obviously we've gone through this shift between um, apocalypse versus human extinction. And then there had to be quite a few, I would say, sort of empirical, um, not necessarily empirical discoveries, but refinement in the way in which we think about existential risk. So in your book, you mentioned population ethics, um, the doomsday principle, um, anthropic cosmological principle. Can you sort of flush some of these ideas out? Um, and, and maybe that'll get us to a, to a point of better understanding as to how people actually conduct existential risk analysis today. Mm, yeah, yeah. So uh, to kind of, you know, flesh it out from the very beginning of what I think of is when people really started to think about extinction in this kind of naturalistic sense uh you know sense of humanity disappearing within a desacralized non-theistic cosmos um i think people start to kind of play around with that idea in the the enlightenment um and uh you know it enters into popular culture with the romantic movement a lot of the second generation romantics so byron shelley uh, mary shelley percy shelley um they produced these kind of poems and novels uh, the best one is mary shelley's the last man they produced these kind of literary works that played around with the idea and so i entered into popular culture through that um but then it kind of disappears a little bit in the victorian era uh, not entirely but as a kind of you know last man stories as they were called um then uh with world war one um it, you know the early end of the 1900s uh people begin to actually say um maybe it's actually technology that will kill us so you know maybe it's our it's humans are the biggest risk to themselves so you find some early precursors of people saying things like that but it's really after world war one I, I think that it kind of gains momentum um then obviously uh with the development of nuclear weapons um that becomes a lot more plausible um so you get kind of big intellectuals like you know einstein bertrand russell you know these kind of heavy, heavy hitters uh, start kind of thinking about the issue. Uh, Bertrand Russell is one of the first people that I've seen to really make the point, And this is where at this point becomes a lot more uh, important later on as we kind of lead up to the present day. But he's the first person that I've really seen make the point and make it quite clearly that what's at stake in extinction isn't just the loss of all currently living humans, it's the loss of the entire future. Uh, and that should affect how we think in the vicinity of extinction. Um, so that idea becomes, it gains momentum and becomes more uh, important. Um, in, I think in the 1980s, you get people really kind of starting to say this quite clearly. So Jonathan Shell writes this book, The Face of the Earth, where he makes this point. Uh, Derek Parfit, uh, the um, kind of ethical e ethicist, um, he makes this very clearly in his uh, book, Reasons and Persons. So it's this idea that you know, um, well, the way he puts it, and I think it's 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 useful to run through this because it it puts it so clearly. Uh, is he says, 
imagine three scenarios. Uh, one is peace. Uh, other is a war, a thermonuclear war, uh, where 99% of people or 95%, I can't remember the number, but it's a lot, you know, nearly the majority, um, is in nearly the whole, sorry, uh, die or the third one being where hundred percent of people die. And he said, intuitively, most of us might think that the biggest difference is between zero and 99. He makes the argument that it's actually the bigger difference is between 99 and hundred. Uh, because the people left could recover, history could continue, humanity could eventually, after the vast, vast, unimaginably vast suffering and curtailment of, uh, you know, um, well-being, um, humanity could recover its potential. Uh, but in that 100% case, no, not at all. So you really needed that argument, uh, I think, to bring into clarity uh, just what's at stake. Um, and yeah, the, a couple of these other arguments that you reference uh, are emerging around this time as well. So there's thinking with the anthropic principle from the 60s onwards, at least this doomsday argument. Basically, what's happening here without, you know, without running through the argument, because it's you know, very complicated. Um, but people were bringing kind of the rigor of analytical philosophy to these like vast high stakes questions, which is, um, you know, something that hadn't massively happened so much before. Um, and so I think that, you know, gave a shot in the arm to thinking about these issues uh, and yeah, leading up to the present day, you get people like Nick Bostrom who really kind of taxonomize and analytically um, make the case for, uh, you know, existential risk as a priority that we should really be caring about. Um, so yeah, I, I, that's the kind of sweep as I see it from, you know, uh, the beginning of this to now where there are, you know, um, you know, very bright people who spend their lives thinking about this stuff, uh, which is very novel in human history. You know, the idea that there are people um, who are kind of, you know, spending their whole lives thinking about these kind of questions. Um, you know, if you are accepting that distinction between apocalypse and extinction, you know, in a sense, obviously, we've always had our Cassandras, but this time they've got, you know, empirical weight and, uh, you know, extremely rigorous arguments behind them. Um, so, yeah, you know, I. I think that this is a really hopeful narrative because we're at a quite unique point in time where people are actually really thinking through these things and thinking about the stakes and thinking about ways that we can lessen the risks and ways that we can actually, you know, protect our potential so that we can fulfill it eventually. That's great. Well, I think I'm going to transition over to some of the questions in the chat. Um, Laura had a great point um, sort of at the beginning of the chat, and I'm wondering if uh, I'll, I'll call Laura up to maybe expand upon the comment that she had, um, but it, it, it might be something that you can tie in with the idea of a human vocation that you mentioned at the, at the end of the book. And so Laura, I'll, uh, I'll call you up and uh, you can maybe articulate your comment. Sure, yeah, thank you so much for coming. Um, yeah, it's exciting to have someone in this territory. I just was wondering, yeah, it seems to me like there's a relationship between the world becoming more and more mechanical and kind of industrial in the sense that, that that might actually be in deep antagonism with our deepest humanity. Um, and whether that sense of not really belonging in this mechanical world would make it much easier to imagine that we wouldn't at some point. Mm, yeah, yeah, that, that's a fantastic question. Um, so uh, interestingly enough, um, the idea of humans kind of automating themselves out of existence is quite old. Uh, it goes back to the Victorian era you know, Samuel Butler made kind of uh, an argument to, the, to this effect. Um, it really it's kind of, you be, you begin to see it again in the 60s when kind of there's the, this first kind of summer of AI begins. Um, yeah, so there's always been this fear around that. Um, people have, that's been, what I'm trying to say is that's been some people's kind of cherished end of the world human extinction scenario. Um, I would also make the, the wider point that, you know, our deepest humanity is itself technological, um, very much so, you know, it was kind of, uh, you know, there's plenty of good arguments to show that kind of the human revolution, which was, you know, deep in our evolutionary past, uh, when, you know, humans became kind of behaviorally modern. So, you know, using culture and language and speaking to each other in the way that we might now recognize um, happened because of cooking, which is a technology, and that's also molded our physiology. So we've always been Technological is what I'm trying to say. Um, also, technology comes with massive risks, but if we want to survive into the long term, we will also have to use technology because uh, these background natural risks 
uh, will pile up over a long enough period of time uh, such that as you know 99.9% .9 of all species before us uh, have gone extinct so we will too as well in uh, you know in enough of a time scale um, so you know it's this kind of um, uh, you know it's 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 in a sense it's the poison but it's very much also the cure so that that's like that those are you know my kind of musings on that question but it's a very interesting one any follow-up laura yeah thank you uh, i guess i wasn't thinking so much about like the automization of um yeah artificial intelligence i was thinking about the actual environment like you know suburban suburban plots planned by you know kind of mathematical uh, efficiency models or something you know and and the defense that actually the world that we live in kind of using christopher alexander's word just feels yeah more and more um yeah unnatural inorganic without a concern for the human soul yeah mm, yeah no i do think historically uh thinking this this kind of thinking of the alienation of like the you know modernity has impelled thinking about uh you know how humanity doesn't have a safe secure place in you know in 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 the order of things um but yeah i mean uh we also don't have a safe secure place in the order of nature either uh whether or not it's mechanized but um yeah yeah no i, I, I you know the romantics for example they were very tuned into this idea that you're pointing out and you know probably no coincidence they were also the first uh, people to kind of really create literary works about um you know the world continuing without us that's great thanks guys um i think i'll tag in nathan with his question okay let me let me find it okay so I think it's a multiple question. Um, is there a difference between the fear slash thought of extinction or say, like you said, the loss of the future now in modern culture than in antiquity um, or maybe even prehistory? Um, is it because we have more access to information that we are aware of this um, and that we have a maybe we have a better sense of impending doom or do we even have a better idea? Um, by comparing history. Um, yeah. Mm. yeah, so uh, I guess I would answer that. I'd say, um, you know, uh, the in antiquity, uh, focusing in on, you know, the, the kind of the stuff I was talking about earlier with Aristotle, for example, um, there isn't actually an idea of the loss of the future, uh, given this wider sense of um, plenitude that I've spoken about. So this wider sense that uh, things can be lost, but uh, only locally. So uh, if I say, for example, if I kill all the dodos, it um, doesn't matter because they'll exist somewhere else in the cosmos or will return at some later point of time. Um, and that, you know, there are varying degrees of strength on that point. You, you know, uh, some people said that this applies to individuals, uh, that individual people will return future in the future. Um, you know, that was quite a fringe point. Um, you know, uh, going back to Aristotle, the point I had made about, you know, how he said we, we can't say that we live after Troy. Uh, he's presumably applying um, iterability, repetition, um, however you want to put it. He's applying that to events. Um, so slightly different than individuals, but events, you know, that means that in a sense, we can't lose the future because, uh, you know, in the sense that the future has already happened, um, it will always happen again. Um, uh, so, yeah, I feel that they didn't, you know, they didn't have a sense of this. Uh, the sense of irreversibility and more so the sense of irreversible loss within, uh, within existence, uh, be that loss of our potential or loss of dodos, uh, is, I would argue, a very modern notion. Um, it just doesn't seem to gel well with like human default intuitions about the world. So going back to what I was talking about uh, with the table example, in the same way that, you know, we kind of presume the table just is how it seems to us. Uh, and it took like centuries, a millennia of thinking very carefully through these things before people said otherwise, um, you know, in the same way that that applies, I think, yeah, because you never see an extinction event, um, I guess this might be a better way of explaining it, because you never see an extinction event, uh, 
you know, it takes a lot of uh, kind of holistic evidence about how the way the world just is in the wider, wider sense before you actually can kind of really think and go, yes, this species has existed, has existed, doesn't now and never, never will again. Uh, that takes a lot of um, uh, quite advanced thinking about the world that, you know, we take for granted now because, uh, you know, I, as a kid, I was obsessed with extinction i loved you know the kind of extinct fauna of the the the, the cambrian explosion I, you know I, I was obviously very um acquainted with the idea but the comparison i often make is with um uh say perspective for example so um I, as a kid also i remember just very um easily being able to draw a 3d cube um that's not because i was a genius it's because i just osmosified it through wider culture but perspective itself in the sense of, you know, the way we modern, the way we kind of think about perspective and are able to understand it in paintings that had to be invented and that was invented in the Renaissance. So what I'm saying is, yeah, you know, the idea of the very loss of a future was itself a discovery uh, and was discovered, I think, at a, a certain point in time. Any follow up, Nathan? Yeah, um, I guess in that light, um, since it's pretty modern that we do have a sense of the future or uh, sorry, a sense of the end, a possible end, maybe. Um, how does that affect how much we actually try to work towards the future or our idea to maybe possibly save the future? Like what is, how does that affect us? Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you have to have a sense of what's at stake and therefore you have to have a sense of, uh, our potential to kind of make the world better uh, for ourselves or way more broadly um, before you can think about that. So, um, you know, uh, again, it's somewhat modern to actually really think that the future might be like materially in terms of material conditions for like, you know, everyone, not just, you know, kind of the dramas of, you know, the important monarchs. Uh, in terms of thinking about like uplift, you know, genuine material material change and improvement for everyone, uh, that's also quite a modern idea. So you know, again, to go back to Aristotle, uh, you know, he loves cyclical things, so I'm going to cycle back to him. Uh, you know, when he's talking about the cycle of history and us potentially being closer to the end and Troy being, you know, therefore closer to us, he's obviously has this quite tight idea of the loop of history. Uh, so there isn't actually much future ahead. Uh, the future is again the repetition of the past. So you have to invent the idea of the future and also the idea of what's achievable within it. Um, and you know we've now gained a lot more structure of the idea of what is achievable. Uh, you know, thinking through physical limits, um, the law. You know, more knowledge of the laws of nature and its scope, uh, how big the universe is, for example, all these things this all comes together to have some idea of you know what actually is the upper bound on all achievable things that's not to say that we will achieve it but like just to think through you know that kind of possibility space um these are all yeah again very very modern ideas great thanks to you both um i'm gonna tag in christopher Yeah, I was thinking about, um, you made me think about uh, kind of metaphoric ends of us. Um, I'll just read my question. I was thinking about uh, Earth Human end Independence Days. I was reminded of my my own first uh, confrontation with the end of us, which was Donald Sutherland turning around at the end of that movie, The Body Snatcher. And it's like this squeal. You think he's going to talk and to, to his partner who's left and you realise she's ended. So it's that kind of takeover of our minds where our minds don't exist anymore, where, we, where there's no longer individuals. Or, and I don't know, then there's maybe the discipline we need to get over uh, existential threat and how that is also, I don't know, you know how that then threats uh, is a threat hmm. to our not zombie selves. Yeah, so I mean, uh, we, there's, there's like a very, 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 very rich tradition of uh, metaphoric ends. Um, and I would say that that, can't, you know, th that religious uh, myth, the mythological, you know, Again, I'm making very broad brush distinctions, but, um, you know, that religious mythological way of thinking about the end, the apocalypse uh, is still very much with us, um, but it's something we consume as entertainment now. Yeah. Um, obviously, I, you know, 
there are still religious, a lot of religious people in the world, uh, you know, that genuinely believe in that we live in the end of days and that the, the parousia of Christ's return is, you know, impending. But putting them aside, uh, you know, yeah, we still like Apocalypse because Apocalypse is that sense of revelation. It is that sense of, you know, everything means something in the end. Um, and yes, Hollywood is replete with these. Uh, and they're all, uh, you know, not so much, um, you know, they're, they're all entertainment. Um, so there is still a place for thinking about apocalypse and having millenniums and, you know, the ultimate revelation. Uh, it's what, yeah, it seems almost the biggest place, isn't it? I, I, I don't know. Sometimes I, when I think of uh, the last 20 years of, you know, zomb in popular, you know, Romero from Romero movies to zombie movies and all, you know, and that, that massive fashion, I, I get, yeah, for, uh, yeah. Mm. But I, yeah, I wonder whether it's more than just, yeah, I think it's, yeah, for me, it's always, there's maybe something bubbling. There's definitely something, well, I think there's something bubbling. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's attainment, yeah, but it's enabling us to engage with it just a little bit. Maybe we're just flirting with it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think I think it definitely is that. I mean, there's, there's so much brilliant, like, cultural commentary, uh, media theory on, you know, the figure of the zombie and what it means within our culture. You know, these are all just reflections, quite narrow reflections on ourselves. And those are what entertain us. They definitely entertain me. Um, but yeah, you know, I think that that's the entertainment and I think it's, it's good to kind of cleanly cut that off from, uh, you know, the actual existential risks. And, um, that's why I think, you know, we, we are still going through this kind of discursive development, discursive evolution, uh, where we're still actually really in the process of separating out those things. And if there's one thing, uh, that, you know, I want this book that I've just written to achieve it, it might, you know, might be contributing towards that is yeah, you know, these things are very different. Um, you know, uh, ex existential risk is a very important, very modern idea. Um, those things aren't always the same, but here they are. Um, here's apocalypse. That's this elder idea that we've always had with us. Um, and I'm not saying we should chuck it away. We should discard it, but we can have it in our zombie films, you know, um, but keep that really clean separation. Um, yeah, that's, you know, one of the things that I hope to, you know, um, uh, contribute to in some way. Yeah. Well, and, you know, riffing off what Christopher said, you know, it's probably worth noting too, that, um, as far as I'm aware with Bostrom's idea of existential risk, it's not just the idea that, um, humans are gone physically. I sort of like to tie in this whole idea of, you know, zombies, uh, bye-bye mind and everything in the sense that there's, there's probably situations where, um, you're suffering from a bit of a societal or, or civilization level locked in syndrome, right? You think back to, you know, Huxley's brave new world or, or 1984. These are all, I think, examples of situations in which we're not gone, but our capacity for flourishing in the future is, um, for lack of better words, like terminally ended. I don't know if, if Thomas, you want to sort of riff off that a little bit, but I thought it might be a good point to bring in. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So, um, again, it's, um, interestingly new, uh, to think that there are these kind of, um, lock-in points, as you say. So, um, you know, it's something that people really started to kind of formalize thinking about, uh, like thermodynamics and physical systems where, um, you know, kind of gas particles, um, you know, there's a set, there's, there, there are these systems where eventually every single, um, you know, possible arrangement will happen and happen again and again, there are these systems. Um, and going back to the plenitude point I was making about cyclical histories, if we think of history in that sense, it's similar to that kind of system where, you know, everything will kind of just happen, uh, and will happen again, and we can be assured of that. Um, it's also a new and very uh, useful clean insight to think about um, history in a way that's different from those kind of physical systems where history does have irreversible turning points. Um, so yeah, we can think of these kind of lock in or attractor states um, in the space of, you know, civilization. So the space of civilization's possibilities and its trajectories, there can be these points where say, without, you know, obviously extinction is a lock in state, because once extinctions happened, that's it. Uh, you can't return to an earlier point or, you know, continue the, the kind of the human project, so to speak. Um, so yeah, I think this is, a, and again, I think, you know, people are only just now, uh, you know, beginning to really apply this to thinking about the long term future is thinking about what are these potential other lock in states, apart from human extinction? What are these, you know, irreversible um, forking points? And 
how best can we avoid the bad ones um, or, you know, um, implement ones that, you know, we're very sure would be very good. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, 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 these are very subtle but very important changes in the ways that people think about history. So, yeah, irreversibility is, is, is um, you know, something that I think doesn't come naturally to us when we think about, uh, you know, the long term future, but it's going to be rife with it. So that's why we need to be careful and think about it a lot ahead of time. It was great. Well, thank you. I think I'm going to tag Adam in for a question and we'll see what time that uh, takes us to. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question was, uh, if you perceive there is a risk of cultural sort of na narrative fake catharsis of the catastrophic risks and producing uh, a narrative fatigue, people getting bored with the subject because it's been, it's been like in the culture and the pop culture and then entertainment, Hollywood, wherever, or it's been just talked too much about. Uh, if there's a risk of this actually is going to demotivate us humans from working on the subject of extinction itself. Mm. Yeah. I mean, so I guess I would answer like this, uh, you know, uh, we've been telling stories about the end of the world forever and haven't got sick of it yet. Um, so, you know, I would answer that aspect that way. Uh, it's obviously just something that we find very pleasing. Um, I don't think, you know, uh, that's going to run out anytime soon. Um, and I think, you know, hopefully if we do begin to separate out these things and, you know, um, you know, have the continued apocalyptic tradition uh, and also have, you know, serious scientific rigorous thinking on, you know, uh, existential risk um then if we keep them separate then I, I wouldn't worry about that and that, that's one actually one of the reasons why you know i'm passionate about making that distinction and keeping it clean um you know in the same way that we're able to have science fiction and then also science uh, and those two things can you know have so far happily coexisted and you know um will i'm sure they will continue to you know i don't think there's a competition in between those things uh, so yeah I'm, i'm not particularly worried about that adam you have a follow-up no, thank you. That's fine. I'll uh, riff off Adam's question a little bit, but instead of going to sort of societal level, level fatigue, I'm wondering, you know, dealing with these topics on a regular basis is obviously something that I would imagine is very weighty. They're, they're not light topics to carry around in your head from day to day. And so I wonder, do you find that there's any sort of um, fatigue working in, in this space? Um, is there any sort of burnout that you sort of see people experiencing? And, and, and if that's the case, um, how do you avoid that? Because obviously these are very, very big questions for one or two, five, 10, 15, 20, a hundred people to really be sort of contending with. Mm, yeah. Um, so, uh, just in terms of my own personal experience, I've come out the other end of this you know, project that's kind of emerged as this book, um, I've come out the under, other end of it way more hopeful than I went in. So I went in far more fatalistic, far more kind of, um, you know, uh, yeah, just like less hopeful about the whole thing. It's, it's, it, and the point that I, that, I, that, that I like to make about this is that um, it's very easy for us all to focus on, you know, the risks like hurtling towards us, right? Uh, because they're all in the news all the time. Um, perhaps not the right, the right ones, the right amount are in the news all the time. Um, but nonetheless, you know, um, it has become a more uh, prominent, uh, you know, I think we could perhaps all agree that it has become a more prominent uh, feature of kind of just discourse media, uh, climate change, obviously the past year, you know, <laughs> yeah, you know, there's, there's uh, clear, clear attention to this, these kind of ideas. So it's very easy to pay attention to all that, but it's not easy without, you know, picking through the history of ideas, uh, long term and near term, uh, to actually really take stock and see how far we've come in even being able to think about these things. So just to kind of loop back to the point I made at the beginning, uh, you know, we have to have the right ideas. Um, and, it, you know, obviously that's itself a vast question not to be uh, kind of um, approached here, uh, attempted here is, you know, how do we define what are the right ideas? But we have to have good ideas to be able to, uh, you know, do good things in the world. Um, and so, obviously, you know, if you are to kind of bring up the uh, hurtling down the track metaphor again, if you're driving straight towards a cliff, you want to know about it so you can turn around. And I think we're currently going through that, you know, as, as a culture, as a civilization. 
Um, so I think it's, yeah, it's, it's actually, you know, taking stock and I think it's amazing that, you know, um, I'm very confident that we're the only species on this planet that this planet has ever produced that can actually think about uh, its extinction <laughs> and think about what's potentially at stake in it. Um, so yeah, I, you know, uh, it's a somber topic and obviously weighty, but uh, the very fact that we've even made it this far, I think is astonishing and tells us something about what we have ahead of us and what we actually can achieve if, you know, if we um, make it through. That's great. Well, I'm going to tag Bogna in for one last question before we reach the uh, top of the hour. Bogna, why don't you go ahead? Sure. Hi, everyone. So just to read my question from the chat, I've been reading this scholar, um, Barry Vaca, and he writes that all technologies um, can be divided into cosmic media and social media, and both kind of loop apocalyptic sentiment within because they annihilate ideas of what human subjectivity is. So cosmic media like telescope kind of puts you in the context of expanding cosmos and social media like social media puts you in the context of expanding network society. And you know, even if you go back to the train and the cinema in early cinema studies, there was this link to dehumanization because it changed how perception worked, right? So humans could stay immobile in the train or in the cinema and see the world in motion, which produced this acceleration and uprooting of what humanity is. Unlike in Renaissance perspective, where you know the human eye was meaning making and the master of the world. So the question is. Does every technology have, does every technology produce its own apocalypticism because it has to annihilate by necessity how human perception works? Mm, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think, um, I guess the simple answer would be, uh, yeah, because, um, you know, it's, it's, it's part of this, the really, a really important part of this, like, you know, story that I'm attempting to tell is the shifting of focus from um, and again, I think this is an ongoing uh, shift. So there's actual like, you know, scope for, you know, for people that to actually like, you know, make interventions in this and, uh, you know, potentially be influ influential in that way. Um, you know, uh, the shift from thinking about what humanity is, focusing on that, and perhaps also the near term past of the perhaps the past 100 years, you know, that's the one that we kind of continue to focus on um you know for obvious and good historical reasons um focusing on that to actually gaining this more synoptic view of like you know what humanity is uh capable of and potential of in that space of you know again what i mentioned earlier this kind of the full space of achievability um that's like you know way beyond uh anything that like humans currently are and have already achieved um, obviously, it's going to be a hard space to navigate to get get the right and the good outcomes and the you know the best ones. Um, but yeah, like technology, obviously, um, you know, uh, completely reinvents us all the time, and I think that's you know um, broadly a good thing. And um, uh, you know, I think focusing on what humanity currently is and you know what it's kind of just like you know been doing for in the past in the near term past uh, creates almost like a geocentrism about uh you know history and potential and the future itself the idea that you know we're just always doomed to repeat the past 100 years across you know the potentially the you know millions or even more that lies in wait uh i think you know disbanding that geocentrism about history uh is yeah part of this wider question and um you know uh yeah uh kind of you know um i guess gaining a more capacious view of what it is that we are so like most of the things i think we think that we are when we talk about the human are very contingent and parochial things and i think there's way more scope uh ahead of us uh, and in front yeah that was uh, awesome. And uh, Bogna, great, great question. So I think this basically takes us to the top of the hour. Um, before we close out, Thomas, maybe I'll give you uh, some closing statements if, if you want. Um, and if not, then I'll tag in Phil to uh, plug the next session. Um, closing statements. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the, you know, the, 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 I guess that, yeah, the one thing I want to stress again is that, um, you know, it's potential. I think that's the thing that we should focus on. And 
um that doesn't you know that doesn't mean that it's uh it's 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 um you know um determined or inevitable it's really not um that's the whole point of potential rather than progress or these kind of elder ideas of uh you know the, how the future is going to sweep us up in its kind of uh you know upsurge towards good things uh we need to focus on you know the long-term potential and also its fragility and what we can do now to uh really um you know uh, do our best to vouchsafe that and protect it um i think that's the you know one of the best things that we can do not the only best thing but one of the best things and um yeah i mean that, that's where my work is going next really is kind of um trying to tell the you know this story of you know how have these ideas about you know the super long term and the future and its capacities and its capaciousness for you know good and new things uh how is that kind of pieced together and you know what's the story behind that and you know this x-risk story the story of human extinction is just one kind of piece within that wider thing so yeah uh that's you know watch this space hopefully i'll uh <laughs> you know one day produce another book <laughs> Well, we'll be uh, reading it as soon as you produce it. Um, look, Thomas, thank you so much for the conversation. That was uh, pretty incredible. You obviously have a brilliant mind and we we really appreciate you taking the time to uh, come and chat. You know, I think everyone here uh, gleaned some really, really interesting insight there. So, uh, you yeah, know, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Phil, I'll tag you in to maybe plug the next session that we have going on, I guess, starting in a few minutes. Uh, and then we'll close this out. Just keep in mind that the next session is on a different Zoom link. So uh, you'll have to quit out of this window and go to the next. Bill, if, if, if you're there, I can't see if you're still in the chat. Um, so the, I guess the main topic that I'll focus on is just the, um, uh, I, I guess just what's happened over the past you know, 70 years or so in terms of the riskiness uh, of the world in which we live, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, how, you know, the development of uh, technologies beginning with nuclear weapons, you know, obviously 1940s, um, up till you know the last uh, decade, and then sort of anticipatorily looking uh, into the future, um, how this has uh, radically altered our sense of existential precarity uh, in the universe. So that's and so actually a lot of this will touch on um, uh, issues that uh, Thomas very eloquently uh, articulated, um, and so it, it's it's very much a sort of continuation, I, I think, of uh, his his really superb. Uh, discussion just now. That's great. Look, thank you so much, Phil. We'll see you in a few minutes at uh, the next link. We're going to close this out. But again, Thomas, thank you so much. Phil, thank you for joining us in the next session. We'll see you all in a few minutes time.